Next up, we have an ordinance to rezone property located at the east end of Paget Road at the intersection of Spencer Lake Drive from A1 to PUD. Uh, I know I appreciate everyone's patience. We needed to get some of the other quick business out of the way because we're going to we're going to spend some time on this. First, we're going to have Chris Paxton present to the council uh, uh, about this. Then we will allow the applicant to speak about the development, and then we will have public comment. Uh, if you would try to keep your comments brief and if you would address the council and uh, and we'll go from there. So Chris, we will start with you, sir. I also want to explain that when this comes to a vote of the council, after everyone has made their comments, it will be presented as a positive vote. However, that is how it has to be presented. Then at that time, the council will vote yay or nay. So I want to go ahead and get that out there. Mr. Paxton. Thank you, Mayor. Well, um what we have is an appeal to the city council, which is requesting to rezone property located east of Paget Road at the intersection of Spencer Lake Drive and from A1 to PUD. Um, I do have a presentation. Start with, a, I'll provide a summary staff report. This is a, approximately 11.6 acres. It's a comp the comprehensive plan indicates that this is a single family uh, designation. The request is to rezone the property from A1 to a PUD, proposing 63 single family lots. The traffic impact would likely generate approximately 461 vehicle trips per typical weekday. The RDOT traffic counts nearby indicate 970 at Paget and Prince and approximately 900, excuse me, 760 at uh, Bay Hill and Hogan. Here you can see. Um, uh, Zoom in copy of the of the proposal. You can see it, we have shown the 55 by 78 foot lots, which indicates some of the smaller lots that are proposed with this development. There's a 1.27 acre detention area that's proposed as a part of the uh, conditions and approval for this lot, which would be unbuildable. And there's a 0 0.5 acre transitional outlet on the west end. Master Street Plan indicates that Paget Road is designated as a minor arterial. The proposal includes an interior minor street network which would be private streets with public access maintained by the Property Owners Association with a future street extension to the northeast of this development. Plow Drive to the north includes a stub to the east uh, to the east to Canterbury subdivision to the northeast, which would likely provide an alternative route connection from the stub out of the proposed uh, PUD. Staff indicates that possible route, that possible future connection in yellow. There were two public information sessions for this for this project. At first, there was a 27 uh, unit fiveplex and three triplex unit, which did not gain staff support. The applicant uh, came back with a 50% 50 56% decrease in density from the original proposal. The applicant indicated a PUD rezoning was necessary to topographic constraints at the site. Public meeting was held. Uh, public meetings were held on April the 27th and May 25th. There was opposition to both plans. Public concerns included drainage, wetlands, compatibility, size of homes and lots, traffic, home values, and rental of homes in proximity of larger homes. Staff prohibited discussion of rentals versus owners at the second public information, information session because this is not applicable to any enforceable code requirements. At the Planning Commission meeting, plas, uh, excuse me, planning staff recommended approval of the PUD rezone with 16 conditions of approval. Landon, Sander, Landon Sanders, on behalf of the applicant at the Planning Commission, indicated changes were made after the first public information session to address density, safety, traffic, and drainage. Additional changes were made after the second meeting to address parking and detention pond safety. Opposition was present at the Planning Commission meeting with three members of the audience speaking and a room full of other citizens. The public comment from the, from the general public at the Planning Commission included concerns related to developer maintaining open, excuse me, ownership and renting all homes in the neighborhood, size and lack of green spaces on all lots, lack of cohesiveness with adjacent properties, small driveways that would push parking to the street, runoff from the development to Spencer Lake, increased traffic, appropriateness of the development, PUD being sought to gain more units rather than an R1, drainage from the PUD impact on Spencer Lake. 
some other public comments regarding this this item that were made that were not heard at the Planning Commission meeting included some items against included poor use of PUD zoning. Citizen believed that the PUD zoning should be reserved for mixed use developments only. Should build somewhere else since the developer owns more property. Or affordable housing, but not at this location. Wants the developer to donate the land and turn it into a city park. Some other public comment that was not a part of the Planning Commission meeting that was in, was in favor of this development was higher density development should not be reserved for East Conway. Diverse options should be available throughout the city. Need for more higher density developments. There's stating that there was too much R1 citywide. Compares conversations regarding East and West Conway to redlining. Retiree enjoys smaller lot sizes after downsizing. Smaller units and lots, quote, perfect for some residents. After the general public spoke, the uh, uh, property developer was given three additional minutes of rebuttal from the chair, um, and he addressed setback concerns and the market use at the site and the feasibility of smaller lots to make more affordable homes. Planning Commission, uh, Discussion included uh, considerations against the request. There was multiple commissioners in the first category that spoke ab about their uh, considerations, including public opposition, drainage considerations in wetlands, location, and density. Individual commissioners also spoke on Woodrow Cummins elementary safety concerns, area being mostly A1 zoning, preference of R1 zoning, compatibility in lot and home sizes, wanted expert opinion on the drainage impact, infrastructure and traffic, and lack of uniqueness of the PUD. Some of the planning considerations that were in support of the request that included that it was a great plan or a good plan, that it was just in the wrong location. That was for multiple commissioners. Additional statements included that the second public input session was an improvement from the first public input session. The proposal requesting single family a similar land use to adjacent properties. And the use will be single family, which is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Commissioner stated that it matches the bullet points to consider appropriate zoning and land use. And another commissioner talked about density being considered equally throughout town. And another commissioner discussed affordable housing options needed throughout town and on smaller lots in the future. The Planning Commission voted one in favor, seven against, and one abstain, and the zoning amendment failed. Uh, just for clarification, uh, one of the city council members did ask if, um, if this applicant would be able to bring, if, if this were to fail tonight, if they were, would be able to bring it back within a one-year period. Uh, the answer is that it would require a city council action. Let's talk about the appeal. The applicants believe that the Planning Commission erred in their decision for the following reasons. Number one, the requested rezone is consistent with the city's comprehensive growth plan. Number two, the requested rezone is an appropriate use of land. And number three, that the Planning Commission, in their rationale for the decision making, relied upon factors that are inappropriate for zoning decisions. The director agrees that the city's comprehensive growth plan indicates a single family use at this location and that the applicant has proposed a single family use. Director can state that the land use is consistent with the comprehensive plan. However, the term appropriateness is an opinion statement, which would be indicated by the Planning Commission or the City Council actions. Based on the facts provided by the planning staff, the council will determine if the PUD is appropriate by reviewing the appeal. Director concurs that there were some matters that were discussed that are not relevant to the submission requirements for a planned unit development. However, there were discussions that were likely appropriate. For example, lot sizes and density can be considered with a PUD. Which factors influence voting would be the opinion of each commissioner. Drainage reports are not considered during a rezoning because that level of review is completed prior to the, prior to the actual development. PUD submission requires only in, to only include basic information on the plan for utilities, roads, internal streets, sidewalks, common space, green space, a property owner's association, and a justification letter. The applicant proposes changes that are in, in lieu of typical zoning to overcome the unique hardships. And 
which is why PUD was brought forward. The items not identified would be uh, the items not identified would be governed by R1 zoning and, and uh, requirements throughout the development. Future development of the property undergoes rigorous reviews to verify that it meets the City of Conway code requirements for the development portion of the of a project. So let's take just a few moment, moments to discuss land use. Land use and density are not the same discussion. Land use discussions are relative to the use of property and whether or not the proposed use is appropriate adjacent to the type of use of a neighboring property. Top left, you can see an example of a high volume commercial next to a low density duplex that would likely be not compatible. In the uh, top right, you can see a single family residential next to an adjacent type of single family residential would likely be compatible. To ensure this conforms to the R1 type land use desired by, interested, uh, desired by the interested parties, staff recommended the following conditions. Condition one required single family residential uses at that location. Condition two required that all standards and uses other than those defined by the development plan shall be governed by that R1 zoning district require, the R1 zoning district requirements. Code states that a PUD is intended to, uh, intended for developments that might be impractical or impossible to implement. Conforming to R1 development would be possible, but reserving that oversized detention area to address the drainage and wetlands unique to the site would be, uh, would likely be impractical. PUD districts allow setting of conditions such as land use, building setbacks, parking density, common space, green space, ingress, egress points, architectural design, and landscaping and buffering. Traditional zoning such as R1 does not allow conditions of approval. Some of the current conditions of approval requested on the PUD that would not be applicable if this were an R1 include Distance from sidewalk to garage no less than 20 feet. Enhanced detention pond safety. Higher quality materials and siding. Additional requirements for roof pitches and shingles. Prohibiting accessory structures on smaller lots. And restrictions for fence lines. Additional changes would, that would be likely include a reduction of the size of the open space area for the detention pond. And a reduction in the size of the 0 0.58 acre lot at the entrance of the subdivision. There's also an inability for the city of Conway to require design standards for single family homes in an R1 district. So residential transect model. This is a, the proposed use is a PUD with only single family lots and a 1.27 acre for open space detention, which most uh, commonly aligns with an R1 type zoning. Adjacent, adjacent uses include to the north, there's Woodrow Cummins Elementary. In lower density areas, this would require a, a school would require a conditional use permit. Schools are only allowed by right in higher density areas such as multifamily, commercial, industrial, or institutional zoning districts. When schools are built around lower density areas or ne near greenfield areas, it can be expected that residential development will trend in that area. A1 is designed to protect undeveloped Areas from intense uses until a use pattern is approved and the school was built in an A1 zoning which has an established single family use pattern in this area. To the east is Chestnut Meadows subdivision which is an R1 zoning with single family lots. And to the west is Spencer Lake condominiums which uh, has not been developed since its 2005 approval and will likely require a rezone in the future or a, uh, an amendment to the approved PUD. Um, however, at this time it is approved for a duplex single family and condominium development. Spencer Mountain at the lake is an R1 zoning with single family lots. To the south is an unplatted single family. It has an A1 zoning with a single family use pattern. Um, and A1, as, as we discussed, is designed to protect undeveloped areas from intense uses until that use pattern is approved. Let's talk a little bit about this density. Bear with me on this. So this, this is an item that came up several times previously in previous discussions. Discussion of lot size is not the same as density. The applicant, the applicant is proposing 63 units. The base density is the maximum possible units that's allowed on 11, the 11.6 acres. Residential development density is the remaining units per acre after exactions, for example, when they dedicate right-of-way or a public park space. 
Both a PUD and an R1 zoning have a base density. Both are subject to a residential development density. However, RDD requires plans to calculate. The base density of the proposal is approximately 5.43 units per acre, and the base density of R1 zoning is approximately 7.26 units per acre. The PUD proposes a lower base density than R1 zoning. However, a PUD requires private streets throughout the subdivision that don't count towards the residential development density, and those are maintained by the homeowners association. PUD would require dedication along Paget of about 0.67 acres. The RDD for the, PUD, for the proposed PUD would be based on the remaining approximately 10.93 acres after that dedication. The residential development density for the proposed PUD is approximately 5.76 units per acre. A minimum lot size, let's discuss a little bit about lot sizes. We talked about density, let's talk about the lot sizes. And a, a minimum lot size in an R1 zoning district is approximately 0.14 acre. 6,000 square feet or 60 by 100. The proposed development has 58 lots, which are between 0 0.10 and 0 0.13 acre, or interior lots that are 0.14 acre or larger, one oversized outlot, which is 0.58 acre, and one unbuildable 1.27 acre lot. In the orange, you can see that um, the developer has requested 1.27 acres for the detention area. This was that unique um, item that they had discussed due to topography. This oversized area would be considered unbuildable and would be platted as such. While the lots within the west um, of the while the lots to the west of this PUD and R1 and R1 zoning and transitions are not subject to this consideration, the applicant did include a transition lot. Lot 64 in blue um, is intended to transition the smaller lots from the east to the larger lots to the west. Chris, before you move on, what can go in that transitional lot? Anything? In the transitional lot, as of right now, it would be uh, subject to the R1 development uh, standard. So it would, anything that would be allowed in R1 <coughs> would be allowed in the lot 64. After the planning commission meeting, the applicant made the following amendment requests. Increase the driveway length from 20 feet to 21 feet from the back of the sidewalk to the front of the garage. Change the front setback of the rest of the homes from 15 feet to 12.5 feet. Change the max lot coverage from 40% to 44%. Staff comments on this request is that the applicant would like to recommend these changes to address concerns that were made from the public regarding parking that were provided by the interested parties at the planning commission meeting. The front of homes would likely be up to two and a half feet closer to the private streets than previously requested, and the impact of a 4% 4 4 increase of lot coverage on the smallest lot would be an area of about 180 square feet. If those amendments were adopted, I've highlighted in recommendation number three and recommendation number 16, the red text, um, and, and recommendation number three would switch to, or change to uh, 21 feet. The recommendation and, number, and condition of approval number 16 would change to uh, front 12.5 feet. Staff recommendation for the rezone was approval of the rezone with 16 rec conditions of approval as provided. There's some possible, motion, uh, some possible motions and staff uh, will take any questions. And Mayor, the applicant would like an opportunity to speak as well. Y'all have any questions of Mr. Paxton? Um, real quick, Mr. Pa Paxton, can may ask, it looks like you only have one entrance into the uh, subdivision at this moment, correct? That's correct. The, uh, the current development has one entrance with a future sub out, so any development to the north would be required to connect that and make a, an additional okay. direction. But there's no the guarantee on that. And, and the reason I ask, mm -hmm. I live in a PUD, Turnberry. Okay, and here's what I learned. Um, we Every house in Turnberry has a sprinkler system because if there's only one way in and out, that, it, it, to my knowledge, um, that's a state recommendation or requirement. 
um, for the fire department. They can't get in and out. If, if that, for some reason, that entrance is blocked or whatever the There issue. are fire code requirements, and uh, the fire code is reviewed with the development submittal. So after the rezone, there's still a preliminary plat that would be submitted to the city for review. Those are subject to a full staff review, including engineering uh, for drainage, streets, and including the fire marshal's office and other departments throughout the city. Okay, thanks. I'm just curious. Any other questions for Mr. Paxton? No other questions, but I would like to make a comment if I could. You are the fourth city planner that I've worked with, and I appreciate information. You've given information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. The developer, would you like to speak, sir? If you would state your name and address for the record, please, sir. Good evening, council members, Mr. Mayor. My name is John Pennington. And I'm the managing member of Nichols LLC, which is the petitioner for the PUD here tonight. My address is 306 Salem for the record. Uh, Mr. Mayor, would you like to confirm how much time is allotted? Or you just going to no, sir, just, just go ahead and speak. Okay. That's why we moved it to the I'll last I'll try night, to make cause... it as quick as possible. I know we've been here a long time. Council, mm -hmm. um, we are starting off with a handout, and I think they're making their way around. On these two handouts, you will see a large piece of paper and then a smaller piece of paper. I will address the larger one first. And uh, specifically to Ms. Ward, um, as far as your one entrance, I did speak to um, Webb, sorry. <laughs> um, I did speak to the fire marshal as related to the single entrance. Um, and it is under their purview, as I understand it, um, that they uh, control ingress, egress as far as fire apparatus code, which is what you're referring to as far as your single entrance. Um, and the stub out to the north satisfies his requirement. He's already confirmed that. So that, that addresses specifically your concern. Now so. would affect really your um, or the homeowners or whoever buys the homes Certainly. issue more than it would the PD. Right. Yes. Sir, I'm just curious. Right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So, um, and I'll just briefly touch on the, the larger piece of paper that's in front of you. It shows two plats. The plat at the top is obviously Ivy Ridge. I want to focus your attention to the right on the plat in red letters where it mentions 62 small lots. Overall, the development is 63 small lots, as Mr. Paxson has adequately provided information on. That 63rd lot is a buffer lot that I provided voluntarily to the residents of Spencer Mountain um, as a buffer or transition lot to help assuage some of their concerns. Um, I'm going to assume they're not going to oppose this, the, the large lot. It's as large as any lot you'll find up at Spencer Mountain for the most part. So I'm going to focus my comments on the 62 smaller lots. Now, as far as the... Uh, 62 lots to go you will in order for you to make the proper decision tonight i really think it's appropriate for you to consider what a plat may look like in the future under r1 and that is the plat that you see below in the bottom half of the document this is a hypothetical plat it was drawn by a surveyor it meets every uh, subdivision regulation and zoning code as it relates to r1 uh, as you can see uh, on the right hand side where it says 50 small lots, we were able to achieve 50 small lots with this layout and still achieve a detention basin of three quarters of an acre. Now, Council, I just want to point out the obvious here between 62 small lots and 50 small lots. So, this entire process has been essentially over a difference of 12 lots. I do not see 12 lots rising to the level of extreme um, but for these additional 12 lots what we are proposing obviously is the PUD I see PUDs as a partnership between the developer and the city a partnership should be a win-win and my win is obviously an additional 12 small lots with the buffer lot 13 if you count the buffer and in return what am I giving up and Mr. Paxson's already noted it and I'm sure you're well aware that I'm giving up control, significant tr control through the, through the PUD by allowing you to place conditions which wouldn't be there normally under an R1. And those conditions, Mr. Paxson has done a great job pointing those out, but I'll, I'll touch on them again. You do not get the 
acre unbuildable lot with an R1. You are able to achieve that with the PUD. There are two drainage inputs on this property, one from the east from Chestnut Meadows. It, it actually is a 42 inch storm drain. It's as big as this pulpit. It's very large and it runs water, especially during storms. That is runs east to west uh, and we have to handle that drainage input. There is another drainage input from the south uh, crossing the Hodges properties, which are my neighbors to the south. And we have to deal with those two drainage inputs, which plays into the terrain comment that Mr. Paxson mentioned as it relates to why this isn't appropriate for a PUD. Additionally, there is wetlands that's been identified in the northwest corner. And I can handle those two drainage inputs and the wetlands and install a detention basin that will be designed by my engineers and then reviewed by the city engineers inside the unbuildable lot. Um, and that is something that you can guarantee from to the neighbors with the PUD that you cannot guarantee with, the, with the R1. Another thing you can guarantee is a direct access to Woodrow Cummins campus by students and parents that live in this neighborhood. They direct access to Woodrow Cummins. That is a safety issue and it increases safety and that is something that you can guarantee as well with the PUD. You can guarantee the buffer lot. And specifically related to her comment earlier, a single curb cut maximizes safety by, by, by minimizing the curb cut. I have stood before this council in 2007, eight and nine, and we took this all the way to the Supreme Court regarding curb cuts. And I have learned my lesson. I brought back a PUD that has just one single curb cut. That single curb cut, I cannot get less than one. That curb cut is, is pushed as far south as we can reasonably get it away from Woodrow Cummins Elementary Campus. That allows for traffic to back up as it does on pickup and drop offs. We've also moved that, moved that curb cut south to avoid a signalized intersection or, or a crosswalk that crosses pageant there. This, this curb cut will not interfere with that. So this increases safety. Once again, this is not something that R1 can guarantee you. Let's talk about the houses. The PUD allows you to place a restriction or a condition on quality materials used on the exterior of the home. You can dictate 812 pitch. You can di dictate an architectural shingle, which is a higher grade than a three tab. You can, you can promise the neighbors that the houses will have a fenced yard, which is certainly a reasonable request by an adjoining neighbor. You can guarantee there's a 21 foot parking area behind the garage exclusive of the sidewalk ribbon. This PUD allows you multiple opportunities to protect the neighbors. If your primary concern here tonight is to protect the neighbors, the PUD allows you to do that. If this PUD is denied, at some point in the future, another request will come back as an R1. So the question is, does the PUD allow you to protect the neighbors and their concerns, or does the R1 allow you to do that? And my argument is the PUD allows you to do that. It allows you a seat at the table from a development standpoint while allowing me an additional 12 lots plus the buffer or 13. To wrap up my comments tonight, I want to speak to the affordability issue on this. I have made it clear that I want to build an affordable housing project for Conway. Since 1987, we have built over 600 homes in Conway. My father started the, the business with Pennington Homes, Inc. I've been involved ever since I was very young. We're from a farm family, and if you're walking, you're working. And that has always been the plan when I was growing up. I've been in the construction industry a long time. Over those 600 houses, the vast majority have been under 1,500 square feet. We are very good at developing small homes in Conway. The Sheila can testify she was one of our first purchasers over Stonebridge. Council, allow me to build an affordable house in West Conway. That brings me to the second page. The second page is a screen grab, a screenshot from Realtor.com from this afternoon. I updated it. And in this filter, I've asked the Realtor.com to return a result of all homes that are available in Conway less than $250,000. And I asked it to exclude the homes that are under contract because I assume they will sell. And the map is not the best quality, but the point of it is. There are 19 results returned on this map, three of which are outside of city limits, so we're down to 16. Inside the entire city of Conway, there are only 16 $250,000 homes for sale. 
Now you'll notice the white squares in the map, those are the listings. And you will notice an absence of listings west of Laurel Park. There are zero homes available, $250,000 or less, in West Conway. That includes Ward 3, that includes Ward 1. Council, if you approve this PUD tonight, you will allow me to build 62 homes that will sell for less than $250,000. By allowing me the additional 12 to 13 lots, I'm able to allocate my lot costs over 63 lots instead of 50, essentially, if we're comparing in the R1. And that additional allocation lowers my lot cost. And that lot cost savings can be passed on to the end user, your constituents, in the form of a lower sales price. I'm not going to stand here and promise you that 100% of these are going to be sold to a third party. I may indeed keep some of these as rentals, but that savings could also be passed on to a renter in the form of a lower rental price. Marvin Gardens was completed two years ago, actually one years ago, you, you approved it several years ago, three years ago, I think. That's behind Pediatrics Plus off of college. That was a high density in development, seven and a half foot setbacks in the front and 10 in the back. I'm on record that those setbacks were too small. Um, and I corrected it with this plat. These, these setbacks are larger. But the concept remains the same, that those are 1,350 square foot homes, three bed, two bath, two car garage, of a decent, good quality, fenced yards. Do you have any idea how much I rent those homes for? I rent those homes for $1,275 a month plus a $25 pet fee. The market rent on those homes are over $1,500. But I'm able to pass that savings on because of the higher density that's allowed under that PUD. So density is real, and density is a way to correct our affordable housing problem that we have in Conway, and we do have a problem. Whether you approve this or not, Mr. Shaw stood before you in April and, and echoed what I'm telling you now. He brought, he had an R1 zone, he had an R1 plat with Bell Valley, he asked you to upgrade the PUD to increase the, to increase the density. His justification letter wasn't wetlands and, and, and creeks. It was simply that he just wanted to increase the density in order to provide a cheaper lot. I, I think it was a great. And this council agreed unanimously. You voted that in April. I agree with the decision. This PUD is not much different. Of course, it's, the layout is different, but the spirit is the same. We are seeking to provide the market with an affordable house. And that is what we're asking you to do. I appreciate your time, Council. Do you have any questions? Questions right now, Mr. Pennington. Hey, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pennington. Would anyone else like to speak in favor of this? Okay. Okay. Would anyone like to speak in opposition? If you would, sir, please state your name and address, even though we all know you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Leach. I, um, my home is at uh, 1505 Warwick Hills uh, Lane in uh, Centennial. Um, they gave a, a pretty good uh, background of what's happened in the first three meetings. Um, but if you look at that first handout there, on the first PUD he did, um, Mr. Pennington built 30 homes, okay? And he owns all 30 of them 30 still. What? All 30 homes of, of the PUD, he, he still has every single one of them. So I know he's made a big deal of uh, affordable housing in Conway, um, but I believe he said that these houses probably be around 
175 a foot. And I'm just asking, is that, is that correct? 175 a foot. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with Victoria Park, but if you went over there right now, the highest um, home bot was, a, I think, Miss um, uh, Luters sold it the other day for like $154 a foot. So I'm pretty sure if you went over there and offered $175 a foot, every house over there would sell. And they're uh, 13 to 15 to 1,600 square foot houses with front yards, backyards, um, you know, plenty of room for children to enjoy the backyard and, and retirees. It's just, you can say affordable homes if you want to, but um, I think he also said that these are going to be 1,300 square foot homes. Is that correct? Minimum square foot. If you would, Mr. Lee, direct, direct I'm, your I'm, plan I'm, to council. Well, because I, I just didn't know, because right, I, I, I couldn't remember, because the, 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 uh, the first meeting's not on the, on the internet, I don't right. guess, so I was just trying to make sure that I wouldn't give you all some numbers I pulled out of my head or something. Um, I, uh, if you look at that, that just tells me that pretty much these are going to be rentals, which I don't have a problem with rentals. Just full disclosure, I own 23 homes in Chestnut Meadows that are all rentals. So I'm not saying anything about the rentals, but the biggest thing for me is the density. If you'll look at the, at the second handout here that I gave you all, um, the Conway School District, Woodrow Cummins, purchased land from my understanding talking to uh, builders and people around town is they bought that land behind the school as a buffer to uh, the Rush Howe development land, uh, own land behind them, okay? Uh, they didn't have to on the other side because uh, the Schreckenhoffers and the Marians own their property, their five-acre lots, I believe, uh, where their home is, and um, the Lawrence L. Lasker property was was already there, and it, it, it's, it's um, I think... It, it was for sale, and maybe they sold it, or they didn't get to sell it because of it, because it was wetland or whatever. But um, the PMB investments uh, land that, that we're talking about here, um, when these people purchased their lots, they were on the in the understanding that those lots couldn't be broken up to less than one and a half acres. Is what I've been told. Um, Mr. Pennington, to his credit, I guess, uh, found figured out that Miss Spencer, when she sold those uh, lots of people, she didn't have all the covenants signed by all the owners of those different farms or land, uh, the, the, the different properties around it. And so the covenants of the one and a half acres are supposedly null and void since all of the owners didn't sign the, the paperwork. So that's kind of why we're here today. Uh, Miss uh, McDowell, I don't think, ever thought that the land would ever sell, and that's why it's been A1 so long, because of, a, of the wetlands up front and the, the, the one and a half acre um, uh, covenants that, that were on there. If you'll look at the second page there, it's what's up here. You can see that, and it's already stubbed out to go to the Rush Howe development. So... I've never developed a subdivision, but if that road right there is stubbed out and this passes as a PUD, I would imagine that we all know here that that's going to allow for another PUD right there behind it. It's going to be really, really hard to turn that down. So instead of having 63 homes surrounding this elementary school, we're going to have 130 to 150. Okay? So the density is way too much. Um, I talked to... Um, Officer Hogan today, and he said that, you know, it's it's going to be a problem for them to figure out a way to get the kids, the, the, the walkers and bikers. Uh, there, there's already no sidewalks for the kids from Centennial to go to school. So the kids from Centennial have to walk down our road at Warwick Hills, walk, walk along Tyler, walk over to Cena, walk up to Cena, walk through the woods to go to um, Woodrow Cummins, and to walk to school at Ruth Bull, they have to walk all the way down Cena, all the way to Sterling Point, go down Sterling Point, and then they can get on a sidewalk. So there's no sidewalks. Even though when I built my house seven years ago, 
I paid a fee for the sidewalks to go over the ditch that's, that, that's still a ditch. Um, these roads cannot handle the traffic that's there already, and I think maybe they're addressing that now. But um, right now, there is no way for, the, for, for these kids to walk to school from, from, from Centennial. Um, I don't know how adding 100, I mean, 63 today is going to be feasible. But down the line, if, it, if this passes, I can guarantee you that this rush house is going to be developed either into more houses or a PUD or whatever. And that, that's why it's stubbed out already. That's what's going to happen. Okay. Um, so the density is a, is, is a really big issue with us. Uh, the safety for the kids um, over there, like I said, the reason the school bought the buffer, in my opinion, was they didn't want to have uh, homes right up next to the school behind it, so they bought the land with it as a buffer. Um, as we've gone from uh, starting this, it started out when they first wanted to appeal to the, the people of Centennial and Spencer Mountain was these are going to be $175 a square foot homes. It's not going to detract from our property values, which that's not anything that really matters on this. It, it, it's the density. But it, then it went to uh, East Conway versus West Conway. Well, Marvin Gardens right here in his ad, uh, it says that this development enjoys a great location in West Conway. So he couldn't really use that anymore on the, on the West Conway versus East Conway because he's already using his PUD over there that was approved in West Conway. So when it came to the meeting last meeting, um, there were a couple of members that said we can't use the uh, precedence of one PUD over another, which I disagree with. I mean, if you're putting a, a PUD over in a place where there's um, commercial buildings already, there's a dental office and that kind of stuff. The density doesn't really matter. But when you put it around a school there where the, the roads can't handle the traffic already, um, it's, it's putting stress on those roads. If you go over there before school, after school, the traffic's backed way up past um, almost to starting point where this entrance will be. And that's why they, they've moved it over there. Um, on the second page right here behind the Marvin Gardens, you'll see this was at 1.30 in the afternoon over at his other PUD. The, there's just, this is what happens. I, I own rental homes over on Wineberry before, and I had a uh, tenant that had a heart attack, and we ran into a bunch of students, so they parked on the road a lot. They you know, obviously had parties or whatever, but I had a tenant that had a heart attack. And the emergency vehicles could not get down the road, which if you look at the next page here, I didn't, this is from today, I went over there. Uh, that is a very small SUV in the driveway. The other car is parked on, uh, in the yard, so I parked on the right and then had um, a fellow um, person who was against the PUD drive through the middle. Do you think a fire truck can get through there? Do you think an ambulance can get through there? Well, the night that my, my tenant had a heart attack, they drove through the yard because they, the, the street was blocked. There's no yard for them to get through here. So it's a very, uh, with emergency vehicles, I don't know how you're going to get in there, especially with uh, one entrance, you know. Um, his other PUD um, over there, the front two streets have sidewalks, but there wasn't enough room in the second street, so... Somehow, he built the second two streets without a sidewalk. And I don't know how they got approved, especially with the new ordinances with sidewalks in Conway, but it just seems like the harder he pushes or the harder anyone pushes, they get things passed. And I just, I just don't think that um, with the safety issues of, of, of uh, emergency vehicles and, and that type of stuff, this should be passed over there or, or, or anywhere on, on, on that. Um, the next page is, shows his backyard. He's kind of addressed that tonight where um, 
he was, uh, the, uh, Mr. Pennington was saying that um, this would be for new homeowner, uh, new, new homeowners or first time homeowners or um, retirees trying to downsize. I don't think anybody's really going to go sit in the backyard and look at another fence that's about eight feet away from them. So you can use your own judgment here, but there's going to be 63 more units right there that he's going to own. I mean, if he would be a little bit more open with what his plans are, that would be great, but I don't, I don't think we're going to get that. But um, really the, the, the issue here is the, is the density, and it's, it's going to be more than this. Like I said, it's going to open it up to the, to the next two farms right here that um, are there, and it's just going to be way too dense for that area, especially around an uh, elementary school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Anyone else like to speak in opposition? My name is uh, Jim Stockdale, address 5985, Brush Creek Loop. And I want to first uh, thank the city council. Uh, Y'all very attentive to my phone calls. You called me back, read my emails. I really, really appreciate that. Brief comments real quickly. Uh, the Planning Commission almost voted unanimously to turn this down. So I, I love what the mayor said earlier. This has been a great city. This is a great city working together. I've lived here um, for 36 years and seen Conway grow and just, it's, it's the greatest place in the world to live. I now have 16 grandkids, 13 that live here. Uh, listen to your planning commission. I appreciate their work. They worked, and like you guys have worked. Uh, as a concerned citizen, I have safety issues. Six of my grandchildren are three in Woodrow Cummins, three are in Ruth Doyle Middle School. They come to see grandparents at least once a week, and they walk. So I'm very concerned. Uh, even now, even not only with this development, but further developments, I'm a, I'm a concerned grandfather. Uh, the other issue is the wetlands issue. I'm not sure if how many acres are actually wetlands. And I've talked to many times with the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineer, uh, engineers who will do a study anywhere, anytime. I know there's some cost to it. Uh, it's not my property. Uh, but they, could, they would do a wetland study, and they would give us 100% of how much this area is wetlands. So that's a concern. And then, obviously related to that, uh, Spencer Lake. Uh, I probably fish the lake more than anybody. Uh, I know every 42 acres of that lake, and I am really concerned about the quantity of water that will rush into the lake with this development when you take the natural wetlands away. And I'm also very concerned about the quality of the water. Right now we're dealing with some major silt that's coming from the new development that's just north of the lake. And after every big rain, uh, and they put what they can in it, that, that silt just lands in Spencer Lake. And it's, it's really affecting uh, just uh, the look. And it's a lot different now. My concern with this development, they put it in, take all the trees out, take all everything out uh, as they're developing uh, the acreage into private lots. Any rain that comes, it's just going to flood into that lake, bring more silt, more litter. And one neighbor was even sharing with me, it, it could kill the lake. I'm really, I'm really concerned. But I appreciate y'all's attentiveness, your seriousness to this, and uh, I just uh, thank you for your concern. Thank you, Mr. Stockdale. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> I'm Mary Ellen York. I live at the corner of and Paget. I face Ruth Doyle. I'm half a mile south of Woodrow Cummins, and I'm right there on the corner. I see kids walking home from Ruth Doyle. I see the traffic back up half a mile in the afternoon with kids, with parents going to pick their kids up at Woodrow Cummins. If we're adding all this traffic, 
I've watched the emergency vehicles coming into the neighborhood, um, right behind, you know, the street behind me, between me and the school. And um, they can get through. This is a problem like, like you've, he you've heard. I would highly recommend before you approve this, come sit out in my front yard with me. I'll provide iced tea. <laughs> and you see what this traffic really is like already at school time. I'm concerned about the kids that have to walk. There are kids walking from Ruth Doyle past my property. And we go out and, and watch. My dog and I will go out and watch to make sure the kids are getting off Paget safely. And the amount of cars that back up into my neighborhood and up Spencer Lakes Hill there to pick up their kids from Ruth Doyle is already a lot of traffic blocking our, our driveways. So I just, please, before you approve this, come see what the reality is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. York. Anyone else like to speak? Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. My name is Brandon Rule, 5720 Brush Creek Loop. I've had the honor and the fortune to serve five years in the Planning Commission. I am also a licensed architect, work commercially and uh, residentially across the nation. So I live, eat, and breathe architecture. Uh, this is, I'm probably the most pro development person in the room if Brad hasn't left already. Um, so this is the first time I've ever spoken in opposition of any case. So tonight I'm wearing my Spencer Mountain POA hat. Uh, and our argument is simple. It's just that this location for this development is inappropriate. And we talked about the appropriateness earlier, but. It kind of comes down to, you know, why this site, the site is extremely sensitive, like Mr. Stockstill mentioned the, you know, the, the impacts it could have on the lake. We already talked earlier tonight about what we're doing over at Lake Conway. We could see in the future, potentially, this could be a revisit for Lake Spencer, draining it and reconstructing it. You know, the biggest thing for me is the lot coverage uh, and the sens added sensitivity that that's going to create. You know, we put this amount of permeability or reduction in permeability of the site. Like you said, we're dumping even more water into the lake, more litter, more trash, um, more silt. So, and I have all the confidence in the world and our city engineers, I go through this exercise with them regularly. Um, but, you know, it is unsightly to have a big retention pond out on the corner, right in front of the school, right out in front of the, our pretty entrance into our neighborhood. Um, you know, it's it's a solution, but it's it's not an attractive one. We've we've talked about the the safety issues that come along with having a big detention area like that right out front along the sidewalk that's heavily trafficked by our students uh, and our children. Um, but currently, you know, it exists as a wetlands and it works well. I've ran by this site and seen mallard ducks out there. You know, it's a beautiful piece of property as it sits. Obviously, we can't keep it from developing at some point, you know, and again, I'm pro development. I'd, I'd like to see it developed into something, but I'd rather not see 63 roofs every time we exit our neighborhood. Uh, so my argument would be, you know, I think it, like Mr. Uh, and I think John's done a great job presenting his case. I think they've done a great job of reacting to all the comments that the, the general public has provided. Um, but just this particular site, it just doesn't make sense. You know, the Marvin Gardens works great in town where we've got some walkability, right? Where we've got access to schools, we've got access to services, um, things that make it a pedestrian oriented uh, facility for development. Out here, out on this side of town, like we've been talking about, there's gonna be a dependency for the vehicles. So, you know, it's not a very walkable area unless you're just going to the schools and back. So uh, Spencer Mountain POA is opposed to development. Um, I'm personally opposed to development as it is, but we'd be happy to see and entertain and we'd like you to consider that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, at this time, we'll bring it back to the city council. You want to give a chance to respond? Uh, would y'all like to say anything else? If, if you would, let's try to. <laughs> I'll just be brief. 
Landon Sanders, uh, 306 Salem. Um, okay, I'm here with the applicant, John Pennington, and I was just going to address a couple of the things that were brought up in opposition. Um, first of all, re regarding the traffic, you know, like John said, we reduced this to one curb cut to address the traffic issues and the pedestrian safety issues. And we included that walk walking path uh, that will go to the school to address the school and the student safety issues been brought up about whether the school's at capacity or there's going to be issues there. The school's at 70% capacity, so this isn't going to present an issue there. Um, but it, it was brought up uh, about the, this, this isn't an appropriate spot next to a school. Well, schools all over Conway have high density developments next to them. Uh, Carl Stewart has a, a high density development. Got these cited here and I'll be quick, but Carl Stewart has an MF1 zone next to it. Florence Madison has R2. Bob Portway has uh, C2 and C3 and RMH. Simon has MF1. Theodore Jones has a PUD and C2. Sally Cohn has R2A. And it just keeps going on. So there's high, uh, high density developments all around these schools. And this is appropriate next to this school so the kids can walk to and from. Um, but that, that I'm just trying to address some of the safety issues for the students there. Um, however, um, I also wanted to address a couple other issues. Um, one, uh, density was brought up again, and, and as Mr. Paxton uh, thoroughly described, the residential development uh, density here is less than the base density for R1. So keep that in mind. They're two different things, but it's less. And, um, and all PUDs uh, are different. Every PUD is different, and they're all they're, um, not all PUDs are the same. So um, there was speculation about future PUDs and future developments. Uh, I'd, I'd ask the council to focus on what's in front of them. Uh, there's an R1 zone that was mentioned to the, uh, the, where this stubs out to. That's currently zoned R1. There was speculation as to that and surrounding areas. Let's focus on what's in front of us right here, which is this PUD. And that's the only thing that this, this applicant has control over. Um, Lastly, uh, I, I don't know if there are pictures on, of Marvin Gardens there. There was discussion about that as that was a previous uh, development by our, our uh, applicant here. Uh, but those lots were different. The setbacks were different. The setbacks here are almost double the setbacks on uh, uh, than Marvin Gardens. So if you saw those pictures, it's going to look a lot different in this development than it did in Marvin Gardens. Um, okay, but I, I think that's it. Uh, I just urge the council not to consider any of the rent to own arguments or anything like that, that, that Mr. Paxson brought up um, as those and, and drainage arguments as those are more, uh, uh, those are improper for a land use decision. So, all right, I have any questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and ask me. Honey? Nope. Okay. We're Thank good. you, Mr. Sanders. Okay, Council, we're back to you. I have uh, something I'd like to say. I, I mentioned earlier that I live in a PUD, uh, Turnberry, which was a big... So when someone, just because it is called a PUD, it does not mean that anyone can promise or guarantee that you're going to get a fence, that you're going to get this or that, or that this style of home is going to get built instead of this style of home. Come into Turnberry. Just call me. I'll let you in. We don't have a fence. Neither does my neighbor. Um, I'm not griping about where I live, okay? So uh, don't misunderstand. Um, I'm simply pointing out that who enforces that um, once a neighborhood's been developed? It, then the developer's gone. There's no, uh, so I just don't understand that. And then my, but my main point here really is that so here we have this um which is great at informative and wonderful i'm assuming we printed that in this building mr uh, yes yeah okay thank you okay so tax dollars paid for this we've had three meetings about this particular area now at this point to my knowledge I've um, tried to watch them on video. Um, I think the Conway Planning Commission has a job and that they did it. 
and they're much better versed in this than than I am, and the, than most of us are. So um, they voted. They voted it down. I'm confused as to. Uh, I, I understand this is America. We can appeal things, but you know, at this point, I feel like we're kind of beating a dead horse. If that makes any sense, and I hate that pun or that that uh, analogy, but wow, I mean. We just discussed common corporation rates that affect the entire city of Conway. I think that that is a little bit more important. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying uh, that I can't believe the time and money that has been spent to try and pass this PUD. So that's my, I won't be voting for it. And that's my two cents. Chris can probably address this more, but each PUD is unique. And the fact that your I've PUD heard that didn't three have, times now, the fact tonight. that your PUD didn't have defenses means when the PUD was adopted, it did not require fences. So, well, Turnberry, I have their bylaws, and we're supposed to have them. So, to, to answer your question, when you're talking about bylaws, those are relative to your homeowner's association. That's not relative to your conditions of approval as a part of your planned unit development. Um, the planned unit development. Or the PUD is a part of your zoning. If there's conditions of approval as a part of a zoning, then those are enforceable the same as the zoning code. Um, if they're essentially when you adopt the PUD with any of the regulations that they've addressed as a part of their uh, as a part of their PUD conditions, including the conditions of approval, if if those uh, conditions are violated, it's the equivalent of violating a zoning ordinance. Okay. Thank and you. That, thank you. And that really answers, like I said, I, I don't, wasn't my main point. Um, my main point is just all this time and money spent on this one PUD. And to me, the overall feeling I get is that it's a safety issue for children. Cut and dry. I mean, and... Uh, if anyone wants to argue that, I'll, I'll be glad to argue that as well. But um, I'll be glad to argue that with you. Okay. I'll be glad to do that. Uh, Let's do I am it. not aware. I am not aware of a school in this area, as I believe Mr. Sanders pointed out, that there is a school in our community that does not have high density residential area, either adjacent. It's not to what it. I was speaking about. That's okay. I'm just, I'm talking about something else. You right go now. ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so my question then becomes, if you don't put residential here, what are you going to put here? Offices? 10 acres of offices is going to generate more traffic than 10 acres of single-family housing. Commercial property? There's some commercial property out there? I don't think so. We can't keep a property owner and a developer from selling their property and having someone come in and try to do something constructive with it. And this, to my knowledge, I've only done this a few years, but this and makes we know that <laughs> this makes uh, this makes perfect sense to me because it's single family residential right next to a school. Kids are not going to have to cross the street. Uh, something's going to happen here. Why don't we take control of it as a PUD and have some controls put in on it? Because as single family R1 residential, we lose all control. I don't think that's true, but uh, may I ask Mr. Uh, Councilman Hawkins, how many phone calls from taxpaying Conway citizens and emails did you get in approval of this this PUD? How many people? I'm, I'm, I'm counting them up. Okay. All right. Approval of this. Probably six. Okay. How many did you get in, uh, I guess, against it? Uh, spoke with Dale. 
spoke with the Hodges and the Doors. Anybody else I talked to? Linda, did I talk to you? Anyone else that I talked to? I saw a hand, but I didn't see who it was. <laughs> okay. Okay. I was Sorry. just curious. Well, I, we, uh, I, I think we're here to serve the city of Conway. We absolutely are. Not the developers of Conway. And I have been getting phone calls since March. And somehow that person knew about it before, and that whatever that's fine. I've gotten countless i don't know 50 to 80 emails um a phone call a visit i'd say once a day for the past two weeks um against it i've gotten one phone call pro for it and i had to tell the person you're the only person i've heard from that's for this and Ultimately, the way I look at it, that we're voted in by the city of Conway, I think we answer to them more than we should anyone that's developing. That is, again, in another my mind, reason. We're not answering to a developer, we're answering to a plan, to a development plan that was put down on a sheet of paper years ago. and. In this area, in my mind, it's just... Well, I think we're still answering to voters. Oh, we are. And to citizens, taxpayers. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll say that in my time on the council, this is the most, most unique piece of property that we've had for a PUD. And it's sitting right there in the neck of a lake, throat of a lake. And... I agree they may put something else there, but uh, doesn't fit. I don't know what the future is. That's my thing. I agree with you, Mr. Ledbetter. I think something will go there. I believe it'll probably be R1 at some point in time, but that time is not now. And I understand your point too about taking control. Why not? Could of it control it? it. Yeah. Right, and and I get that, but I, I I've waffled back and forth on this a lot. It's only twelve units. I get that, but I think what bothers me more than anything is we keep talking about affordable housing in West Conway. I can't help but feel like this is going to be rental property. This is not going to be small family buying buying homes. That's just the way I feel about it. And I know that that's not for me to say that I can't control that, but that's just my gut. So I, I can't support it right now. I, I, I was uh, quiet. Uh, uh, Bill, will you pull your microphone? I said I was going to be quiet because I'm sure that's unusual for y'all to believe. But I think before we've had issues and we – have talked about undermining the planning commission's vote. And I think they did their job and I'm voting yes. the way they suggested. Any other comments? Okay, hey, council, back to you. All right. Um I will say this this is um, an item that I struggle with. Um, it is property that is going to be developed at some time. Um, our normal progression as a city council when property is A1 is to go to R1. Um, I have heard from, I think, six to seven people who are against. Um, and Cindy, I definitely appreciate what you said about um, the citizens because we do serve the citizens. I know that typically the years that I've been on the council, which are 25 now, 
when there is a development, what you hear very loudly are the people who are against. That's just a known fact. So yes, we do listen to the residents, but a lot of the people who are in support are, I guess, don't have a dog in the fight. A lot of those people don't come out. Those are also our voting constituents. Um, I know a couple of you I've gotten emails from and I've talked to some of you and I know one in particular has said that you're fine with the R1. That's what a normal progression would be. So something is going to go there and the normal progression is going to be an R1. There is no control that can be put on anything when you go strictly to an R1 zoning. You're still going to have some of the issues that have been addressed. Um, schools, as any school, you're going to have traffic that's going to be there. You're going to have multiple use housing that's going to be there. What I would challenge you to do is to, going forward, um, consider the options in some of your minds, <clears throat> excuse me, in some of your minds, this may not be the best use, but something is going to go there. And the normal progression typically from this council has always been an A1 to an R1. And I personally don't see that changing. What else? Council, what's your wishes? Well, Mayor, considering that this has to be something that's posted on the city site to approve this request. I'll second. I have a motion and a second to approve this request. Any further discussion? Well, let's, let's make fully sure. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows what they're supposed to do. The, re the request yeah. is to override the Planning Commission's decision, right? That's correct. That's correct. A vote in the affirmative does that. Right. A vote no upholds the Planning Commission's decision. Correct. Correct. Mr. Before, Hawkins. Before we vote, Mr. Paxton had said something earlier in his presentation about bringing this back up within a year. Can you give us the, 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 the rules of that situation? Yes, I can. The, the current way that the, the uh, code is written, if this, this, uh, this action is not about the specific zoning, it's about the appeal. So if you, uh, for example, were to deny this uh, appeal, uh, then it upholds the Planning Commission's decision. If, it, Regardless, if, uh, if this were to be denied, the, the zoning action was denied. The zoning action cannot be, um, it sets a moratorium of 12 months onto the property uh, where the applicant cannot request a rezoning at that property of, to any other zoning district for that 12-month period unless otherwise approved by the City Council right. by a simple majority vote. And by a simple majority or it doesn't specify the 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 requirements so it's taken as simple majority unless unless the city attorney has some additional input on that this so, issue came up before <clears throat> it if did. i remember correctly i had to bring this to y'all's attention if this is the way it's supposed to be what's that what he said because someone someone tried to bring it back early and i told you that's not the rule with the simple majority or with the but it's got it's got to be up to us to allow it to happen. Right. Well, mm -hmm. I can I can tell you what the council rules are as it applies to planning, and this did come up before, so I'll just read it. I know we've been here for a long time, but I'll be brief as I can. Y'all wrote the rules, so I'm just reading. <laughs> uh, any planning item that has been placed on the agenda may be withdrawn, and this is talking about the withdrawal process, but that's where the 12 months comes from. It says that if an item does not require prior planning commission approval, it shall not be placed back on the city council agenda for a period of 12 months unless that time is waived by two thirds vote of the city council. So the key takes, is the takes. rules, the city council rules read is whether the, the item requires uh, planning commission approval before it comes to the council. If it doesn't, 
require the planning commission to approve it, then they then the applicant would have to wait a year. If it does require a planning commission approval, then the applicant does not have to wait a year. So um, for him to bring it back in an and one. That's the withdrawal process. And then you read the final part. Any planning item that has been considered by the city council and fails to receive a majority vote when the question is put to the council shall be deemed terminated as to the approval process and must be submitted for reconsideration according to the procedures I just read. So I'm not seeing majority vote. That may be something that was a separate ordinance that you're referring to, but in the, the council rules. From the ordinance, not from the procedural order of the city council, from the okay. ordinance in the, in the uh, subdivision code or the zoning code. You'll have to forgive me. I'm, there's too many of these codes. There's a lot of codes. <laughs> so uh, the ordinance doesn't clarify if it's simple majority or two thirds. So that type of vote, if it's not clarified, would fall back to a simple majority. Uh, however, if the procedural order states the two thirds, then in my opinion, that would that would be the. So would this be so something that would require with this action the rezone require planning commission approvals? I read the statute. And this is. Um, for the rezone to make it this far, uh, then it would have required the planning commission to forward it here. What we're actually hearing is not a rezone; it's the appeal right. of the dis of a denial. So um, that would be where your determination would come off of. Is since this is in, if, so, for example, if this is withdrawn, they're not withdrawing the rezone request; they're withdrawing their appeal. So, in making my motion, do I need to say? That it could be cut, that it can come back within a year. No, no, no. Or no. 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 Okay. Believe that the proper procedure would be if the applicant makes the request, it has to go to the city council for consideration, and then it would go to the planning commission. Right. Okay. We we did so this before. We don't do it now. We just wait until they. It would be bounding back and forth. It would go city council first, then to, then to the planning commission, then back to, then back to the city council. Can we get some more government? There you go. Okay, any, any further questions or discussion? David, clarify the vote again. Well, could I respectfully ask you to make your motion that first one? I move to uphold the Planning Commission's denial. That, that is my motion. That would be a yes. Here's the Planning Commission. Okay. okay. Who seconded it? Seconded. Mr. Hawkins seconded. Okay. I seconded that. Okay. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Mr. No, Garrett. We're going to hold the planning commission's denial. Okay. So a positive vote be yes. It means yes. we. Okay. Then it, then we is not, it's not confused. Okay. Correct. If Mr. Jones is correct. Excuse me. I'm not going to say it twice. <laughs> this is already recorded. It's going to be for the ordinance. No, this is an, an appeal. Ordinance at all. Correct. The voice. Do. Mel. Aye. No. Yes. Well. Aye. Aye. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yes. Okay, so the vote is six to one in the positive to uphold the planning commission to uh, vote to turn this PUD down. Seven to one. I'm sorry, seven to one. That's right, we're all here now. Okay.